Hi, we're going to get started. If you don't know me, I am Aggie Toppins. I'm the chair of undergraduate design here at the Sam Fox School, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening for this Henry L. and Natalie E. Freund Visiting Artist Lecture. Tonight, our guest speaker is Kelly Anderson. So before we begin, I have a couple announcements. First, if you are a student who would like to register the fact that you have been here tonight, look for this QR code. <laughs> there, there's one, I think, on the, there's possibly one on the door, and there's one in the lobby out here. Um, just walk up and scan that. That's, that's one um, logistical announcement. Um, and the next announcement is um, to, to say thank you to the Freund family for their generous support of this lecture series. Uh, visiting artists and designers are a very special part of the learning community we have here in the Sam Fox School and at Wash U. So let's please give a round of applause to the Freund family for this generous <laughs> donation. All right, now I'd, now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Kelly Anderson uses magic to connect people, design magic in fact, to connect people with the depth and possibility of the world. Two of her books push the bounds of publishing. In 2015, she created This Book is a Camera, published by MoMA, a printed book that transforms into a working camera. And in 2017, she followed with This Book is a Planetarium, published by Chronicle, and this book houses numerous paper devices, including a planetarium, and it's sold more than 100,000 copies. Kelly's other projects include a viral paper record player and in collaboration with the Yes Men, a utopian counterfeited New York Times, which won the Ars Electronica Prix. Her animation experiments on the risograph have garnered international attention and led to many workshops. Um, doctors have used her award-winning TinyBot human body app to communicate treatments in children's hospitals and to indigenous Australians. Her other clients include NPR, The New Yorker, The Guggenheim, MoMA, Apple, and The New York Times. Anderson has redesigned brands like Russ and Daughters and Momofuku, or two of them, and she's exhibited internationally for her independent projects and have been supported by, many of her independent projects have been supported by the Japan Foundation, Exploratorium, Adobe, the Center for Book Arts, Mass Mocha, ITP, and the Letterform Archive. She has a big fan base here at the Sam Fox School, so please join me in welcoming. Kelly Anderson. Wow, thank you so much for that introduction, and now I'm going to try to live up to it. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, my work um, sort of asks, implicitly asks this question of why is lo-fi still relevant in our high-tech world, so that's sort of a framing device for you know, this presentation, which is kind of all over the place, like my career. So if you want to follow me on this path, and I should say, I love questions. I love audience participation. So if you see something and you're like, I feel moved to ask a question right now, feel free. Just like interrupt me. It's totally invited. Um, so yeah, I'm, um, I'm a graphic designer and I do traditional graphic design, like branding um, and, you know, restaurant identities, um, uh, drawing lettering, designing menus. This is all for Russ and Daughters, which is sort of like a bagel and lox institution in New York City. Um, but, you know, I also play around a lot with materials and human perception and trying to find like different um, possibilities hiding in plain sight. Like I really believe in this idea of like tunneling inward into whatever the thing is that's in front of your face to try to find like the alternative realms within them. Um, so I like exist in this, you know, space that's sort of like in between art and tech. Like I teach at ITP, which is like the oldest art and tech um, grad school program in the country. Um, and I, I feel like I'm, in a way, just like not interested in tech, but I'm really interested in like discovering new possibilities. Uh, so there's like some overlap in the Venn diagram there, but there's an equal amount of overlap with like the book arts people and the printmaking people. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, in this, this weird, weird space. Um, <clears throat> but in my work, I've definitely adopted this methodology of like testing and tinkering with things rather than like assuming what 
um, I should do with things. This is a <laughs> this is a, a protest sign that I made for the 2020 Black Lives Matter march um, out of some cardboard. That was fun. <laughs> um, this is uh, an animation I made out of a puddle of water. So this is Mui Bridges running horse, maybe familiar to a lot of you in art school. And I made it by, um, if, if anyone has seen a, a Cree cut, I think you might have one here, like a silhouette. Um, cricket, I always say that wrong. Um, but, but yeah, I basically cut out vinyl stencils and then use this material called Rain-X that people put on their windshields to, it's a hydrophobic coating that makes water not want to go where it's spread. And so I use the vinyl to um, make sort of like a safe space puddle in <laughs> the shape of an A and the shape of Mui Bridge's horse. Um, and I don't know what this is for, and no one asked me to do this. There's no client paying, paying for this, but it was just something that, I got so excited, like, will this work, that I had to kind of like see it come into formation. So <clears throat> that's actually the driving force behind most of these projects that I'm gonna show you tonight, honestly. Um, so I think a lot of times people might say that this is misusing materials. Um, I like to think of it instead as letting the materials tell me what they can and can't do, rather than us, you know, reading what the Rain-X bottle says it's for. Um, it is most definitely for creating animations. Um, <laughs> my uh, favorite uh, misuse of a technology lately is this technique of creating Rezo animations. Um, so uh, these are, this is another one. Um, so these are printed animations that are printed on the Rezo, then scanned back in and kind of like reconstituted as um, an animation. And they combine, um, a lot of aspects of like digital image making and animation that are very appealing to me. You have all of that control, you get an after effects from things like, you know, ease in, ease out, um, but also taking the best from like this analog world. Um, so, you know, I feel like in that purgatory where you have that tension between digital and analog that we all sort of like ping pong back and forth between, that you really get like, really exciting, interesting new possibilities. Um, and the Rezo is my favorite printing technology because it is stuck in the same purgatory we are all stuck in um, between physical and digital. Um, and you know, the result is that, you know, you'll have all of this. This was a collaboration I made with Jason Uwan. Um, so you can see sort of like the smoothness and slickness that's brought by Cinema 4D, which is how he made um, this typographic animation um, for Klim. But then once it's printed on the Rezo, you just get like all of that physical analog artifacting um, from the Rezo itself. You get the green touch sort of stochastic um, noise pattern um, through which it interpol interprets gradients. Um, anytime like a little piece of hair or a piece of dust or dirt falls onto you, it, you like, that's part of the animation now. Um, there's also this charming thing that the Rezo does where it never registers colors together. So it's always like a fight to keep your, for example, fluorescent orange and blue layer in alignment. Um, and you know, in no place is that sort of like bug more apparent than in an animation where you can see it like moving in and out of registration. Um, so the animation is really, uh, shout out to XYZ type, Ben. <laughs> um, yeah, so the animation is really a way to like celebrate all of these idiosyncrasies that like really give us like that sort of like warmth and noise and like grit that we try to hold on to in analog experiences. Um, I also like it because every time you print an animation, you also get this artifact. You get these contact sheets with all of the frames. Um, so I have pushed myself to figure out like creative ways to use them. So with Ben and Jesse from XYZ Type, we created, um, you know, little something for Instagram, four color Rezo animation showing off their um, new typeface. But then also when people bought the font, then you know they were mailed this, this poster, which was five colors of Rezo that had to be in alignment. It was just, I don't recommend this to anyone, but <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so this is another one for an art book fair that I organized in, in Brooklyn where the frames sort of like became the poster. So there was a way to use um, that pile of like make ready that would otherwise just kind of get thrown out. 
Um, but yeah, even then, I love going from digital to analog, then back to digital. So this is taking those same animations and like putting them in After Effects with the difference filter, which really, really accentuates the noise. Um, I like to call it goth mode. Um, this is another one. This is an animation for a friend of mine who's a musician named Taraka. Who's um, this was a music video. I don't know if anyone has seen this before, but there's a whole group of people on the internet who believe you can communicate with aliens with a certain numerical code of ones and zeros. And so we created this music video trying to like channel and <laughs> talk to the other side. Um, I'm not sure if it worked, but uh, it looked pretty cool, you know. <laughs> Um, this was a, an actual paying client job that was Rezo Animation, which is the rare thing. Um, so this was a little TV um, ID bumper for Vice, and um, they were like the best client because it was like the most poetic brief that I gave them. I was like, well, I want it to feel like you're on the subway when the sun is setting and you get that like warm light reflection from the other side of the street coming in, highlighting the infrastructure of the city, and they were like, yeah, sounds cool, do that. <laughs> so, um, this is a uh, Rizzo animation on the cover of Graphic Magazine. So this came out in October. And if you scan in the cover of the magazine, they actually printed like 800 of these and like sent them out into the world. Um, and if you scanned in the cover of the animation, you got this, uh, this Rizzo animation that is very like Carl Martin's in spirit um, on their cover. So yeah, like let me tell you a little bit about like how I got into doing this type of work. So um, I don't know, about a decade, decade and some change ago, I was doing a ton of data visual, um, data visualization. So there's always been this duality in my work um, with the data visualization. I really enjoyed making these invisible forces in the world visible. Um, data visualization work is really all about like bringing facts from the abstract realm, from the numerical realm, into the sphere of perception so that you can viscerally see, feel, or experience those facts. Um, and the other part of my work's duality is that ever since I was a little kid, I've just been obsessed with things that seem like magic, that perform as if they're magic, but have no hidden parts. Like that to me is the best type of magic. Like I. I have an iPhone and I do think it's magic sometimes. Um, but these things where you can see them in the totality and you still can't really explain why they work um, are amazing. And there's an aspect to this lo-fi magic that exists in this realm of novelty. <laughs> like, like my cat here, you see it once, you realize it's a trick and then you're never fooled again and then it's done, you're done with it and it's over. Um, but I believe that like as a designer, there's this whole realm beyond the trick, um, this other side to things behaving in ways that we don't expect. Um, so, you know, when we talk about magic, what we're really talking about is a blind spot in our understanding of how the world works, which is rapidly revealed to us through an object, through some kind of like material intervention. Um, and so, you know, a lot of uh, illusions occur because we're not actually aware of how our own perceptual system works. And we aren't aware of how basic things like light, you know, works. Um, it's so ubiquitous that we just like don't really like think about it. Um, this, by the way, is a phenomenon that I'm slightly obsessed with. So this is called moray magnification, and it happens when you have um, an open uh, grid, which occurs at, like the holes are at the same period as like the printed grid underneath it. And what happens is like. This happens for the same reason that like, if you're driving down the highway and you see a billboard and it's partially obstructed by like a tree branch, you can still read the words. It happens because our brains just like always wanna fill in those blanks and those gaps with patterns. And so when the, pa the, when the tree branch is actually like a highly regimented system, your brain is like, oh, I can't see that part. It must be a bigger dot. It must be a bigger dot. Oh, it's an even bigger dot, even though, you know, it's not a bigger dot. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to use the same technique to create a clock where time is coming and going because it doesn't just work with dots, it works with any small shape. So you can print out like little teeny tiny numbers and put it on a grid and it'll appear like it's enlarging and then going away. So I'm working on this 
with my friend CWMT. Hopefully it'll come out this year. Um, has, anyone, has anyone ever made one of these before? Yeah? Wait, what are they? Wait, has everyone made one before? <laughs> you all even know the name. So for those of you who haven't made this before, I would recommend like running home right after the lecture and making one. I almost brought strips of paper today because I feel like this is so important that everyone do this. Um, so what you do is you tape a take a strip of paper, you twist it once but not twice, and then you tape it together. And what you've made is like this very simple mechanism that turns a two-sided surface into a one-sided surface. So if you draw a line down the middle of it, like is shown here, you end up in the same place where you began. Um, and I show this because I feel like it really gets at why I'm so obsessed with like humble materials and playing around with them because this is kind of as simple a preparation of like a thing as you could ever hope for, right? <laughs> you know, like someone who is um, three years old could make this. Um, but it also, it's, it's vastly easier to understand in paper than on paper, um, which is true of a lot of things and definitely a lot of things that fall under like the purview of, of graphic design. Um, so, you know, if you go and try to read the Wikipedia article for what a Mobius strip is and how it works, um, I, I didn't get very far. I feel like you might require an advanced degree in math to be able to read this article. Um, which is funny because usually a Wikipedia article is like the most pedestrian entry point for like any <laughs> you know type of information. Um, so you know there's oh and this is uh, this is a book by Eric Domain who's at MIT called Geometric Folding Algorithms, um, and it basically uh, he talks a lot about you know how the the sort of like the human superpower that's unlocked when our brains and our hands are allowed to work in tandem. Um, where we're allowed to, you know, find mysteries like sort of like firsthand um, and then like later bring them into like this formalized space that, you know, we can interact with socially and turn into equations. Um, so, you know, a lot of of unsolvable problems, it turns out, in science and engineering are folding and unfolding problems. Um, an example of this is just you know, you can take DNA, so DNA um, sequences come folded like origami, and it's long been kind of like a thorny problem of like, <clears throat> what are the minimum amount of places you need to cut it so that it can unfurl and you can still keep the sequence intact. Um, another fun problem um, <laughs> that he talks about in this book is this problem of like, you know, how do you best fold up a um, an airbag within your your car's steering column so that it most rapidly unfurls upon impact. Um, so these are all problems that benefit from being tangible by making them tangible um, because when we make them tangible, like we can open them up to physical intuition um, and physical discovery. Um, so, you know, I continue to tinker with like the most basic materials in my own work. And my favorite thing that happens is like when I make something, but I can't quite explain in formalized terms why it works. Um, so this is a very strange holiday card that I made a very long time ago. Um, and what happens is when you, you pick it up in your hands, it, it automatically wants to flop in certain ways. And you discover by like letting it flop like the way it tells you it wants to, that it takes you through this simple never ending story like the Mobius strip. And so this, this card is, it's a, a four frame documentary about receiving this card, just kind of like <laughs> over and over and over again. It's very relaxing and meditative or just like, oh my God, <laughs> this again, depending on your mood. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I love it because it's, 
I'm not gonna say it's as simple as a material can get because I think the Mobius strip like sort of like takes to the trophy on that one, but it's one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper printed on two sides with a couple of cuts and like two glue pieces. Um, and it's just kind of like, I don't know, like I put it together and then I'm trying to like understand it from frame to frame and it just kind of like breaks my brain. And so I feel like I really can like work at the limit of my abilities and like make the best, like most mysterious work that I can make, like when I kind of like go back and forth um, between thinking about things like in terms of like, you know, formal math and like tinkering with my hands. Um, but yeah, like I think within the context of our modern world, we think of paper as nothing, as like non-functional, but you know, because it's inherently structural, it can be shaped to tap into forces we don't see, whether they're, you know, complex math, uh, <laughs> where we can't even read the Wikipedia article, um, or, you know, whether we are folding a paper into a paper airplane where we can make air visible, or, you know, taking paper and making it into a cone to make sound directional. Um, I, I just feel like the way that paper can be like this tangible interface on realms of the invisible and of abstractions um, that are difficult to interact with otherwise. It's just like a very, very appealing aspect of um, both paper and graphic design to me. Um, so this is, this is a project that I worked on I thought this was mostly going to be like a typography project. So um, I created this risographed set of different origami tessellations and designed a typeface for each one where the typeface um, or the lettering um, resembled, there was sort of like a 2D version of like what these 3D tessellations were. Um, so this is an example of one of them. And I developed this around the time when like everyone was playing with variable type and there was like endless animations of like type interpolating along the axes of weight or um, you know, from narrow to extended. And I was like, okay, I want to interpolate my type but in a way that you could never do on a slider. You know, something that could only exist in 3D space. And so I created this sort of like warpy destruction of, um, of itself. Um, and in researching these tessellations, I learned something surprising. Um, so origami um, is typically considered in the realm of craft. Um, it's usually not considered in the context of uh, tech. But this origami form, which is called the Miyori fold, was invented by a Japanese astrophysicist named Koryo Miori. And I say invented with like a little bit of skepticism because I have seen this same folded form in pictures from Joseph Albers like paper class from like the 1920s, 1930s. So um, it was definitely like named for Koryo Miori. But the reason it was named for him um, and why he kind of, I, I don't know, think deserves the name is because he used it to create this satellite um, array. And I'm not sure why this is the only picture that seems to exist of the satellite array, but like what it does, um, it houses these solar panels on each one of these planes and it crunches up in this way. Um, does anyone have any guesses for why it might be advantageous to put solar panels on a structure like this? Don't be shy. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, because the sun like moves. And so basically this is like a very, very low energy way. Um, this form is, is considered an auxetic metamaterial, meaning that if you pull it up down, it also springs out left, right, kind of like a multi-directional paper spring. So you need like very, very simple like motor setup to you, um, very low energy way of like getting all of those solar panels to rotate in this like very choreographed way to like track with the sun. Um, but yeah, this was kind of a revelation to me that like sent me down this rabbit hole and there's this really a kind of like rich history of um, spacecraft design being uh, inspired by origami. And so I spent like a little while like researching and teaching um, and thinking about this idea of like 
you know, well, why do we call some of these things craft and why do we call some of these things tech when they both produce um, function? And, you know, I, I, it's tempting to think that, like, that has more to do with dominance of the Western Industrial Revolution than it does actual function. Um, and the main place that I've been, been thinking about this is in the context of a paper engineering class that I teach. Um, so this is where um, students from all over the world kind of gather over Zoom. And um, paper engineering is like, you know, kind of, it's kind of a field, kind of not a field, but it's this umbrella term that um, connects all of these different paper mechanisms that have a functional aspect to them. So whether they're the mechanics used in pop-up books or in tessellations, um, or in slice form construction, um, or in things like compliant mechanisms, which, um, I don't know, if there's a Brigham Young compliant mechanism lab that has a whole bunch of, of different ideas. But um, students seem to be like really into this and like make really, really cool projects. So I also just wanted to like show off some of their work. Um, the prompt for this assignment was actually make air visible, which, uh, is, is Bruno Minari's idea, but I love it, and I'm just taking it as my own. <laughs> um, but, you know, I like to, um, I like to point this out to design students, is that there's usually like two inroads to every problem. Um, you know, you can get to places pretty quickly and shape an idea, pass it around, make an idea social. Um, if you approach it in this like formalized mathematical manner. Um, so if you wanna talk about like what a circle is, like this is what a circle is, you know, it's a bunch of points that are equidistant uh, from this central point. But this is also a circle. Um, it, it looks like a Krispy Kreme donut, but <laughs> I want you to focus on the center. Um, so this is a very, 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 very old circle. Um, it's one of, you know, thought to be one of the first perfect circles that was ever made by man. And it was made, you know, before formal mathematics existed, um, before industrialized precision um, in creating shapes was a thing. Um, and it was made, Maybe a picture in your mind first. How do you think it was made? And now I'm gonna show you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so it was made through a gesture. It was made by taking a small hard stone and rotating it into this larger rock. And so what happens is that that small stone finds like its central point and then scrapes away the larger rock at, from that central point at a fixed axis. And the only shape that can result from such a gesture is a perfect circle. So it's the same thing where you have that center point with all those equidistant points, but it was made through kind of like a dance move rather than, you know, <laughs> through formalized mathematics. Um, so, you know, in my own work, I realized that, you know, I can get much farther in thinking about complexity. Um, if I use like these craft superpowers of getting my brain and my hand to work in tandem. Um, so some of the, the very uh, <laughs> exciting problems I've applied this to is, for example, um, I made myself like a little paper computer that tells me whether or not I should take freelance jobs. Um, <laughs> So I call it the existential calculator because it solves my existential crises. Um, I don't know if you all have this like in your lives and careers. It's like you'll get an email and it'll describe a job and there's always something that's wrong with it. Like either everything's great and there's no money or <laughs> it's like, I don't know, for a horrible company you never wanted to work for, but they want to like, I don't know, give you a pound of gold or something. Um, so yeah, so I, I created this paper calculator um, and asked this question, should I take that job? Um, and it's it's called a Vovel, and these things, you know, before there were computers or even calculators, there's obviously still the need for calculation. Um, Vovels first appeared in like astronomy books in the 1500s to explain what was happening in astronomical phenomenon 
Um, they really like were very popular though in like the 1940s, 1950s sort of advertising world where you had these handy gadgets. Like say you have a farm and you're trying to figure out like how many asparagus seeds to plant so that you can harvest 15 bushels in the fall. So you turn your little farm calculator, you're like 15 bushels is what I want. And it'll tell you how many seeds to buy. So um, kind of an advertising gimmick, but also very, <laughs> very cool and very fun. Um, and the way that the calculation was done was through a series of like nested and cut wheels that take an entire set of possibilities and then by turning it, making a decision, the die cut highlights different areas and so you're like winnowing down this possibility set into the one answer that applies to you. Um, so they were essentially like the apps of the 1900s because they would like calculate one thing. <laughs> They do, you need a whole like filing cabinet of them to like, you know, do all of the calculations in your life. So mine, um, this existential calculator is programmed with social science research about what makes people happy and fulfilled and avoid like midlife crises and work. Um, which boils down to these four main considerations. Um, what are the working conditions like? Do you feel, which is a subjective, do you feel like your work is making the world better or worse? Um, is it a good fit for you? And what's the money like? So the overlap of those factors um, tells you a whole lot about your future <laughs> with this job. So this um, is sort of a paper chatbot that I made which facilitates a philosophical discussion with oneself about the nature of work and happiness um, by answering the question of should I take that job which you rate uh, the attributes of by turning these paper wheels to answer questions on the nature of the working conditions um, all the way to the amount of money you're paid. And it outputs a specific color that correlates to the attributes of this job, which you can then find on the back and it'll tell you what to expect in your future. So the way that these world wheels work is that underneath them, the entire possibility set is printed. Um, and the wheels, by turning them and making selections, um, by answering those questions, you're winnowing down the possibilities from the entire possibility set. So this first wheel, there are four possible answers, which I've marked in red, yellow, uh, green, and blue. And turning the wheel um, eliminates 75% of those options. The second wheel winnows it down even further. There are three answers here, which I'm marking with um, one, two and three for each color. Okay, that, this is getting very nerdy, but you all understand, right? <laughs> the magic of die cuts. Um, so when you flip it over and find your color on the back, you kind of like trace it out from the center out to the periphery and all of the lines you pass like apply to your condition. And so there are a lot of like adjacent conditions. So, you know, like the, you know, character building and let's hope you like ramen aren't that far away from like the being able to, you know, like, um, oh wait, where is it? The Isle of Suffering for someone else's art. So the brown, the brown zone is, it makes fun of everyone, but the brown zone is the real awful. That's the zone where like, you're working on things you think that make, make the world worse. You're not getting paid any money. Um, yeah, and the working conditions are like abysmal. But the fun thing about this, and the, I think the thing that makes it a little bit different than like an online quiz is that you can find where you land in the spectrum of work. And if you're not happy with where you are, if you're like, this is not my beautiful house, then you can go back to the other side and like renegotiate like those values with yourself and like figure out where you end up. And so, um, it actually like kind of does a lot <laughs> for, for how simple and kind of silly it is. Um, so yeah, I, I work on projects that prod at this question of like, you know, in, in an age with like artificial intelligence and self-driving cars and whatnot, why should anyone care at all about paper technology and paper computers? Um, and like the most compelling proof that I've received so far in my career that this is a legitimate area of inquiry was the response I received to this project. Um, which I took on just for fun, but ended up like getting me to ask like really interesting questions that became kind of generative questions in my career. So this was, um, this was a while ago, this was about 10 years ago. Some friends of mine, Mike and Karen, approached me to make their wedding invitation. And 
Mike is a very, very talented um, sound engineer. Like he's engineered albums for Paul Simon. My friend Karen is just amazing. She's been like a open source activist lawyer for like the past 15 years, um, but also DJed. So we're like, okay, need this wedding invitation to be about music somehow. And uh, we cycled through like a ton of really bad ideas. Like there was a suggestion that we should just print sheet music and then force like all the recipients to perform it to be able to experience the wedding invitation, which is like, a whole lot, asking people to do a whole lot of work for not much like joy that you're delivering them. So like the ratio is like a little bit off. Um, but I had this memory from um, this kids science show that I saw when I was a really little kid. It, it was a rerun. Um, there was this show on PBS called um, Mr. Wizard. Oh no, I hit, I hit the button too many times. I'm revealing where, what this is. Um, <laughs> no one, no one saw this. Hold on. <laughs> okay, forget you saw that. Okay, so there was this show when I was a kid uh, called Mr. Wizard. I think, it, like, they didn't play Mr. Wizard beyond the 80s. Like, if you're younger, like, if you were born in the 90s and you haven't ever heard of Mr. Wizard, it's because he was really mean to kids, like... <laughs> He would be like, hey, you know, Timmy, like, what do you think this thing does? And Timmy would be very earnestly be like, oh, well, I believe it does this. And he's like, no, that's wrong. There's a whole, Google, Google Mr. Wizard is a dick, and you'll find, like, a whole, like, quick cut YouTube video of examples of this. Um, but anyway, he did this experiment that resonated with, like, young me so much that, like, I brought it into my adult life and um, brought it to this project. So... What he did was he took a piece of paper and rolled it up into a cone and taped it shut and taped a needle to the end of it. And that was all that was necessary and sufficient to amplify this information that's encoded into the groove of the record into the realm of audibility, which blew my mind because I thought that like only record players could do that. You know, I thought that you needed like a highly tech technologized um, machine to perform that function. Um, so I was like, hey, Mike and Karen, you know what we should do? We should make paper record player wedding invitations for all of your guests rather than respectable grown-up invitations. And so um, <laughs> and then, then the onus was on me to like figure out how to make this happen. And so I searched around for paper that had the best uh, sound properties and... Yeah, I, I was calling paper suppliers, and I was like, hey, which one is the loudest? And I'm like, we don't know. <laughs> what kind of question is that? <laughs> um, but meanwhile, my friends were writing this really cute song, inviting guests to the wedding, which we put onto a clear flexi disc. So, you know, normally vinyl records are opaque. They're usually black. They're thick. Um, a flexi disc is like a really crappy record, and so it's made out of acetate. It's very thin. The grooves are very shallow. But the reason that we wanted to use um, this clear format is because we wanted to hand it to the guests and have them like complete their friends in all of these different scenarios. So, actually. Oh, there was one more slide I thought I had in here. But anyway, like you turn um, Mike and Karen, who are printed in black, every 90 degrees you like complete the picture of them together. So here they are growing old together in funny old person clothes. Um, so this was a way to get people's fingers on the record, turning the record as a first step. Because then the next step is you have to turn this at exactly 45 RPM. If it's less than that, it's going to sound like a demon from the inner level of hell. <laughs> if it's faster than that, it's the chipmunk. So 45 RPM. Um, of course, no one could do that. Only I could do it, and it still doesn't sound good. But So that's the invitation part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so the, there's a little needle on this red dot that you place on the record and then turn. <laughs> and that's what the real song sounds like. <laughs> yeah. 
so yeah, I mean, I was I was so excited when I finally got that to work, and Mike and Karen were stoked too. But um, it was the funniest thing because I uploaded it to the internet that video, and people like were freaking out. Like it went viral in a way that like I don't even understand how. Like I got invited on morning time TV shows, like. <laughs> And I was like, they're going to know that, like, this thing doesn't work. <laughs> like, they're going to figure out that it just, like, doesn't work well. Um, I just, like, practiced over and over again, like, my 45 RPM dance. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, like, I, I was very excited to take people's compliments. But I had stumbled upon this, like, really interesting question. Um, you know, like, we all say we want our technology to get better. <laughs> like we want sound um, quality from our record players to get more and more high quality. We don't want it to backtrack. And so like why was everyone freaking out um, about this, this record player? Which brings me back to this generative question. Um, so, you know, I had stumbled upon something really, really interesting here. And I realized that there is kind of this dimension in our relationship with our things that modern tech doesn't get yet. And I don't quite understand it, but I've been exploring it, exploring this idea through like different projects for probably like the last um, eight years now. So, and I'll tell you my theory. So, I, you know, I think modern tech is very good at like wish fulfillment. Like modern tech is very good at like giving us what we want. Um, it's kind of on this collision course with like perfect efficiency and wish fulfillment. Um, all of those logical extensions um, of the stated original pursuit of technology, um, you know, to ease our the burden of humanity to do the work for us. So this is um, down the street from me. This is like a 1950s stack guillotine paper cutter, and like the logo is so funny because it's like it promises to turn back time. Just imagine all the time you're going to save if you don't have to cut each one of these pieces of paper individually. So like this is what technology has been promising to do for us: is to give us more time to be human. Um, so, but, you know, maybe that's only part of, of what we, we need. Um, I, I think that there might have been something meaningful that less advanced technology was giving us sort of accidentally as like this byproduct. Um, so my, my theory is that uh, we intellectually think and intuit a lot more about the world through our bodies and through touch, through friction and resistance much more than is acknowledged. And we need it a lot more than it is acknowledged. Um, during this section, I'm just gratuitously showing you some stop motion animation that I made for Tiny Bop's Human Body app, um, which I also designed. So, you know, when I was working on this, this app, um, I realized that the, the nervous system doesn't end with the brain alone. We are not brains in chars. Um, it extends all the way to the skin. So. Um, there's this great Hermann von Helmholtz quotes that says, you know, all we know, everything is an event on the skin. And it's true, like, every time you read something in a book, that's light photons hitting your retina. Every time you hear something, that's wobbly air hitting your eardrum. Um, and I think in the age of information, it's very easy to think about the information and not the way that it, it gets there. But I think as... Um, designers and makers, you know, thinking about these, these mysteries. It's very interesting. Um, but yeah, we're simply hardwired to have this very, very deep, very rich intellectual and philosophical life through how we interface with the physical world. So analog tech, um, I don't know if anyone's had this experience of playing around with an antenna, like on a radio or on a car. Yeah, I see some people nodding. It's not a great experience. It's, it's fantastic that you can now just like pick up your phone and like tune into a radio station. But the feeling of like, you know, actually interacting with like all of this like invisible country music and car ads, there's something profound in that like it makes you aware of this like vast context that there's all of these invisible songs kind of like floating in the air around you. Um, so, you know, this is something, I'm going back to my roots as a <laughs> data visualization person. This is something we intuitively know when we design infographics. Um, you know, when we are attempting to bridge the gap between numbers and human experience. Um, and I'm stealing this directly from, from Brett Victor, a talk that he gave 
um, Brett Victor's uh, the engineer at Apple who designed all of the, the touch gestures for iPhone. Um, you know, when you're talking about numbers, your computer wants a spreadsheet, you know, rows and columns of numbers. Like if you ever do anything in processing or open frameworks, like this is what the CSV looks like that you have to, to input. Um, but if I ask you as human beings to look at those numbers and try to make sense of it, to tell me something about it, like what's the largest number, what's the smallest number, you know, what's the trend, what's it doing, it's impossible. But as soon as you take those same numbers and put them on a map, it opens them up to thousands and thousands of years of evolution, which we're like kind of unaware of, but we benefit from, um, of navigating the world spatially. So kind of like the same skills you'll use to like exit the auditorium and not run into people, you can use to look at these numbers and start you know, viscerally understanding like what they're doing. Um, so in a second, you can find the highest one, the lowest one, talk about the trend. Um, so, so yeah, those tangible, there's a, a name for this, those tangible reasoning skills. Um, in AI, they talk a lot about like Moravex paradox. Um, I think it, Moravex or Moravex, I don't know. Uh, but it's basically, you know, the things that come most easily to us are very sophisticated spatial reasoning skills, for example, um, are the things that are hardest to teach computers and machines to do. And so there's intelligence that two-year-olds have that are just, you know, it's gonna be decades away <laughs> from um, anyone even coming close to being able to code them. Um, maybe more than decades, because we don't understand ourselves, you know, and how we work um, that much. So anyway, getting to my theory, I think lo-fi things, um, just they perform this secondary function that we never really talked about of tethering us, of orienting us as like material beings um, within this larger universe of material things um, of which we're a part. So, you know, they're kind of a portal, um, like a connection to the world outside of us. Um, so it is about connection and orientation. Um, and I, I think it is like a very deeply human experience to, you know, just kind of interact with gravity and sound and time to see, um, you know, whenever I work on an animation project, sometimes people give me a hard time about this, but I'm always trying to like leave in like a little bit of glue and a little bit of texture and a little bit of like the strings, you know, and um, in this case, because I feel like it adds like another sensory inroad, like, um, you know, that, you know, everyone's had this experience of like flying a kite, you know, and so I want to connect with that and those experiences. Um, yeah, so I think that that is my very long-winded conclusion of like why I think people were into this. Um, we all read about how sound works in a science book and it wasn't like a moving experience, but somehow, when you do it with your own hand and you have this like connection where you can feel like how the sound works, um, it's a little bit different than just like knowing. Um, so, oh good, that's that video I was looking for earlier. So yeah, <laughs> he, turned, he turned their cute little faces and complete the picture. Um, so, so yeah, that's why we use such crappy records is because of that. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, taking what I learned from that project, I've moved on to try to create work where I provide kind of as little as I can, um, where there are no hidden parts. It's sort of like the opposite of a black box experience. Um, and allow like that to be like the venue for some kind of magic to um, transpire between the user, um, user or reader and the book. So, um, this is, this is by far the largest one in terms of like distribution and stuff. So this is called, This Book is a Planetarium. And uh, I, it's a very, very literal title. Um, I think I'm the queen of literal titles. So if anyone is trying to find a title for their like detective novel where you give away the ending, you know, come talk to me. <laughs> but yeah, so the book asks, um, you know, how does it work and presents the reader with these like pared down paper versions of all of these things that are typically con considered technologies. So 
We have a... Uh, I'm just going to show you the whole video. So we have a perpetual calendar which talks about how Gregorian time works um, and how it syncs up ungracefully with natural time. Um, there's an instrument that talks about like what sound waves are and like how to change things like pitch. Um, there's a decoder ring which talks, it's a basic Caesar cipher and it talks about like the basis of computer uh, encryption. Um, the speaker talks about like sound waves and volume and directionality. Spirograph is kind of like open frameworks, but in a book. <laughs> Yeah, and it's called This Book is a Planetarium because I think objectively the planetarium is the most exciting pop-up. So you turn the flashlight on your smartphone, put it in the planetarium, and um, then you have stars all over your ceiling. But yeah, I'm hoping that it gets like kids and adults into like deeper, more interesting questions faster about how the fundamentals of their world work rather than just asking like how does it work in terms of like what were the decisions that a person made when they designed it. Um, and I made this and I was kind of afraid that kids would look at me like in the same way that I look at my grandparents, like, you know, when they tell me about like playing kick the can, um, <laughs> but kids are really into it. And, you know, um, I also take like great joy in the fact that like you still need to use your iPhone, but you use it as like a dumb light, you know, <laughs> to like use this book. <laughs> so, um. So yeah, the other, uh, the other book in, in that series uh, is called This Book is a, a Camera, and it's a, a sort of like a, like a guide to help you think about like how light works in the world around you. Um, so another very, very literal title. <laughs> so you open it up, um, and there's a pop-up camera in there, and you can load in photo paper in the dark into the back of it and then take it outside. And when you lift that dark slide, it allows light to enter the pinhole and then hit the photo paper. And then you can develop it with instant coffee and baking soda. So very good for like the end of the world or something, you know? <laughs> During the pandemic, this was very popular because it was like, all you need is instant coffee, baking soda in a bathroom. And you can have this whole photo practice. Um, I don't actually know if it's like less toxic though, because it's so much like instant coffee. <laughs> like it would, it would probably kill you if you took a sip of it. Um, but it takes pretty cool photos. So it's, um, it's pinhole photography. Um, have, has anyone here done pinhole photography before? Awesome, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Yeah, so you all, you all know who have done it that pinhole photography is interesting because you don't have the concept of depth of field and focus in the same way that you do with lens photography. So everything's in the same amount of focus and kind of comes in on a flat plane. So this is a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge and you notice you can see the rivets in the the foreground and also the background. Um, so it's a, a less advanced camera technology. Like this was the type of cameras you had at the very, very, very dawn of photography. Um, but it functions and it creates an aesthetic that is not, you know, I wouldn't say that it's inferior to, you know, modern photography. It's just kind of different. Um, so yeah, I, I self-published this book in, um, 2015 and then um, MoMA picked it up and republished it. So it kind of got to a larger audience, which was cool. Um, I wanna tell you about the, the next pop-up book uh, that's coming out next year. I'm gonna knock on wood, hopefully it really is. Um, <laughs> so I've been working um, on a book about type and technology um, and how typography is shaped by technology. And um, there was actually a show at the Center for Book Arts last year. And so I'm gonna show you the show and this new pop-up book at the same time. So this is the show at the Center for Book Arts. And I'm really interested, um, this is a graphic I'm showing um, over here on the left-hand side by um, Aldo Novarisi. And people, I think people are generally pretty literate about different periods of like architectural history and art history and how the values of those different time periods um, become aestheticized and become visual. 
um, in expression. But you know, type also contains like the values of those civilizations. Um, and a lot of times, the way that the type is shaped has to do with the technology that produced it. Um, so these are some shots from my show at the Center for Book Arts. And it ties into my interest uh, about perception also. So this is um, a really great quote from um, Garrett Nordzies that says, typography is a good model for observing perception because with its strict rules, it creates an artificial laboratory-like workspace that everyone has within their reach. The relationship between shape and countershape, which in writing amounts to the relation between black and white, is the foundation of perception. The interpretation from any sense organ relies on this principle of contrast. Um, and I, I, love, I love that idea, that it's a way of exploring perception. Um, there's so many artists that I admire. Um, light and space artists, James Terrell, Doug Wheeler, um, but all of their work requires like such a big production to make. And I love that those same principles can be explored in this like intimate handheld um, microcosm of typography. Um, so the show was organized around the series of essays, um, which I <laughs> rezo printed and folded up like napkins. Um, in the bathroom and put in these boxes. So like you could take, if you could take an essay and then the next one would come up. <laughs> it worked most of the time. Sometimes they got stuck and we'd find people like, ah, like reaching up in there, you know. But, um, but yeah, here's some gratuitous floaty footage of the boxes, <laughs> which were very hard to build <laughs> and uh, these, these pamphlets. Um, so the show was uh, the show was divided up into these four different sections, which dealt with like four different periods of typographic technology, um, and wanted to give people kind of like a how we got to now um, in terms of like the diversity that we see in um, typographic styles. Um, so this was a, a table I made that was you know an interactive ex explanation of anti-aliasing. So. Had a whole bunch of like cool like arcade game bitmap fonts, uh, low res, and then um, this is polarization filter. Has anyone else played with the stuff? Yeah, cool. It's really like way too expensive, but really fun. <laughs> um, yeah. So what happens is that when it's at a zero degree angle, all the light passes through, and if you turn it to ninety degrees, then it becomes one hundred percent black. Um, same material that like sunglasses are made out of. Um, but really good way to like make, you know, that feathered edge um, with anti-aliasing. So yeah, it was really fun because like people would just like play with it and make different type bases and messages and like send them to me. Um, yeah, but it was also like a really good, um, this is a book that's like clear when it's closed and the polarization filters make it have a letter when it's open. Um, really good, fun sort of like playground where people could just like come in and like play with like all of these like different ideas and then if they were curious about it and wanted to learn more then they could like you know go into that more granular experience of reading the essays um, and learning a little bit more about it so so yeah um, the same content is going to be in a book which is um, going to be published by letterform archive that I've been working on and um, I've just been playing around with like different ways to like express concepts like variable type on sliders, but <laughs> with with paper. Um, this uh, this one accompanies this turns from a I'm showing you the rough prototypes because I don't think I'm supposed to show too much of this yet, but this turns from um, a letter Y into a letter Z when you when you pull it, and it um, accompanies an essay that's about typography and automation and that history. Um, this is the O, which I am very proud of. <laughs> very spinny. <laughs> um, so this is kind of like a build it yourself, the rough prototype of it, um, about typographic anatomy. So like talking about senders and descenders and um, serifs and all of these things. Um, this one is about gas pipe lettering. So it basically shows this modular system, um, you know, and gives you this, this little gas pipe thing. 
Yeah, so just showing you some goodies. I know I don't have much time left, but I'm gonna talk for like two more minutes, yeah. So, um, oh, very excited about this one. So this is, <laughs> this is about uh, typography that's based on uh, super ellipse shape. And so it's like ellipses versus super ellipses, yeah. Um, this one explains how photo typesetting technology works and um, the essay that accompanies it is all about psychedelic light shows and warping and this whole phenomenon of like, you know, taking these 2D shapes and like warping them in topographic like 3D ways. Um, so yeah, I've been having like a lot of fun prototyping these ideas as a way of exploring history and hopefully getting to pull more people down this like nerdy rabbit hole <laughs> that I find so interesting. Um, I really think that letter forms contain like the secret history of the world. Um, this is a prototype for the cover. So it's going to be like a, like a seven segment display and it works better than this now, which is good. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it changes from like an A to a Z, uh, yeah. So it's the most absurd book cover I think ever made, but they said yes to it, so, <laughs> so that's good. Um, and I think it's actually gonna look like that. So we're gonna have like a little bit of those transparent elements so you can see like the fun things happening behind the scenes there. Um, and that might be the title page, that might be the table of contents, or that might be the table of contents. <laughs> we're still deciding. I think I literally have 75 designs for the table of contents, which is silly. But all of the essays um, are structured in this way where they answer this question of a letter is blank. Um, and it starts with A, a letter is a shape, and goes through the history of like, you know, why these symbols have the shapes that they do. Um, uh, okay, I know I'm out of time. I'm gonna spend like two minutes telling you about other stuff I've been doing lately. So I started this crazy thing this year, um, which I'm calling Good Mail Club, where I use it as an excuse to produce a different um, experimental project, like every month, and then I mail them to like hundreds of people. So this is my diagram of how I think the post office works, and these are just like some of the projects I've been working on for it. So every, um, my apartment's always filled with like hundreds of like boxes and things in progress now, but um, I think it's gonna be a really great productive year where I make a ton of stuff, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is kind of like the whole, the whole purpose of it. So um, yeah, I think that's all I have and I'm out of time, but I would just so love it if you all asked me some questions. I love answering questions. So thank you so much for coming too. Who has questions? Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for coming today. This is amazing, amazing stuff. Oh, um, thanks. <laughs> I'm, I'm a student here in design, and uh, I guess, like, seeing all of this stuff, I I'm sure that you do a lot of, um, work to understand the science behind everything here. Um, like when you were showing us that Wikipedia page, I'm sure that you've had to go through a lot of things like that to really understand. I'm curious, what is that process of research like for you? And do you feel like research is a more heavy aspect of your design process um, than for other designers? That's a really, really good question. Well, I mean, I feel like my science abilities and knowledge are very limited, which is why I'm so inspired by kids' science shows <laughs> and science books. But um, I really do believe that you can explore those same concepts, like using your hands, using this like tinkering approach, using craft methodologies and like making things. Um, so I think a lot of times like it isn't necessary, which is good in my case <laughs> to like truly understand it because I, I still frankly don't understand like the topology of a Mobius strip and like why that works. It still just seems like magic to me. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would like to think like if I had infinite time, I would get a subscription in nature and just like read it front to cover and you know, think about how to apply that to graphic design. And I, that, that, that is my dream 
my dream about time. Um, but yeah, like I don't. I also think it's you can play with your hands, and you don't have to do that that deep research. I sometimes feel like after I make something, I want to know how it works and I want to be able to talk about it and see what other ideas it connects to. Um, and then sometimes I just plow on and keep making things, so. <laughs> More questions? Okay. I'll get there soon. You could just throw it. <laughs> I was just wondering, looking at some of your paper prototypes, um, are you starting just like with a paper and a pair of scissors, or are, as you are talking about tech, are, do you have favorite tools that you use to kind of get started with those, or love to know about your process for those? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really, really great question. Um, so, you know, whenever you make a pop-up book, I'm sure, you know, most of you all have sent a file, an Illustrator file to the printer before. And perhaps you've even sent an Illustrator file that has an art layer and like a fold layer, you know, for score lines, like a brochure. So the way pop-up books are made, it's like a complicated version of that where, you know, you have your art layer, your um, score layer, and your cut layer. And so, you know, I tend to like want to set up my projects like that and like work in this digital space and figure things out. But, um, you know, so the final file has to go to the printer like that. That same file can be used with like, you know, a Cricut, Silhouette. Um, I have a Craft Robo, which I totally love, which is kind of like a slightly more powerful version of those um, prototyping tools. And so I tend to like try to like, you know, send things to the cutter, piece it together. but. Um, I've been really strengthening my skills this past year of just kind of like riffing. So taking a pile of paper, taking some scissors, um, using artist tape, the best tape for like prototyping pop-up books. Um, it's like somewhere in between like basking tape and like a permanent tape. It's really awesome. Um, so I feel like I've been doing it wrong for <laughs> because I always want to like jump into like creating these final shapes. But a lot of times things work when they're like kind of mushy and like handmade and then you kind of like formalize the exact angles that you need like as you go. And so if you all are, are working in this mode, I would encourage you to be like a little bit messy, a little bit impressionistic and like find your way towards like the more hard edge lines um, because otherwise it's like more difficult to get there. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I also really love um, Nina Classic Crest Paper, I think is like the one that's like the best for like pop-up book stuff. Hey. Kelly, uh, what do you do when you get frustrated? <laughs> oh, um, I mean, actually I have slides for this. <laughs> oh wait, I just have to show you the mailers from my mail club, I'm so excited. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm gonna go into my, hold on, I need to show you what I do when I get frustrated. So remember that, that, that wedding invitation I made? I've literally been trying to make like a record player book for like six years now. And I work on it for at least a month every year. And I have like all of these different like super cool ways that like the needle can drop on the record, like there could be an arm, turns 90, you know, 45 degrees, drops on the record. Oh, this one's, this one's better. Is it better? Hold on, how many do I have in here? So I probably, I would say that, I mean, the, the number of prototypes I've made for this, probably in the hundreds, because I, oh yeah, okay, this is the one I should have showed you. Um, yeah, so like this one, the needle is on the horn, it picks up, it drops on the record, like a record player, and then you turn it, and it sounds pretty good. Um, but I really like, <laughs> for, I worked on this really pretty hard. This is me at the Exploratorium. I was like prototyping it with like the Exploratorium team. Um, and I got it to the state and I was like, you know what? Like there's something just like really nice and elegant about like a piece of paper with one fold in it, you know, that can then act as a record player. And so, um, 
so yeah, I've been really frustrated with this project. I feel like I kind of like floated away from my core concept. It sounds really good, right? <laughs> anyway, um, this, pro this project is very frustrating. It's frustrating on a conceptual level. It's frustrating like in terms of materials. No one in the US can make a good record and I don't know why. Like you have to go to Europe to get like any depth to the grooves. Um, but, but yeah, so I've been very frustrated with this and so like I'll work on it for a while and then I'll get frustrated and I'll just stop. But I'll come back to it. But I, in the meantime, I have also created this paper radio, which is like a copper coil that you like tune and can go to different radio stations by like getting the coils to go further away from each other. You could barely hear it. Like it worked well at the Exploratorium because they're like on the water and it worked well. Uh, I did a residency at Mass Mocha and they are like uh, three miles away from a country station and we're like, we can hear they're selling cars, <laughs> you know, it was just like, it was like the most amazing experience. But I took it back to New York City and it's like, nope, nothing. It's like, <laughs> like too much concrete everywhere. So this is another one that's like really super frustrating. Look at us, we're so victorious looking. Little did I know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, um, I don't know. I, I think, I mean, maybe I should just tell all the students here is that like I'm, frustrated and the project's a failure for like 99.9% .9 of the time I'm working on the project and it's only that final ta-da where I'm like cool <laughs> it worked <laughs> so and sometimes this goes on for like you know years and years and years so um yeah I don't know hopefully I, I don't want to promise anything but hopefully I'll I'll come up with solutions to these problems soon and this will exist <laughs> but Ellie, I wonder if you can talk about iteration and your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, that. I don't know. It's funny, My friend, I just saw my friend Tamara texted me and, and she is very much like Paul Rand in that she's like, the first solution is the best solution and it's the only one I'm gonna offer you. Like she does all of these illustrations for the New Yorker and she's like, no, you get one, you get one option. Like I'm not doing sketches, you get one option. <laughs> And she has a career. I mean, I don't know. It's uh, it's cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm not like that. Like I really sometimes I'll, but sometimes I really will make like a hundred different versions of something, and I'll be like, oh yeah, the first one was best, and so I I need to get a little bit like tomorrow. Um, but I think there's like a lot of different ways to work, and um, I think sometimes like you just have to like satisfy your own uncertainty by prototyping a whole lot. Um, but I think it's also good to just like get other people involved. So um, with this project, with this project, um, my friend Simon is a really, really good paper engineer and um, I gave it to Simon for like a month to noodle on just to see what like another person's perspective and hands might do with this content. So. Um, so yeah, this has been such a journey. Like, do you all know the band They Might Be Giants? <laughs> they actually, I worked on a music video for them. Like, um, I wanna say, when was that? It was like nine years ago, maybe seven years ago. I don't know, something like that. But um, when I got done, I sent them the prototypes for this and I was like, hey, maybe you all, do you wanna write a song for this? And they actually like wrote a song for this. And I still, I'm like, I don't know. There's this whole history of like, hip hop, do I really want, I don't know, like this band with two white, I don't know, I just like had this whole like spiritual conflict about like misrepresenting like turntables and records and stuff. So I don't know, I am I'm going to figure this out uh, one day, but um, in the meantime, I have a website that makes it seem like I've accomplished things if you wanna go do it. <laughs> These are all of the things that are uh, less in the struggle category now, so <laughs> yeah. Um, any other questions? Um, thank you. Maybe less of a question, but I just wanted to um, acknowledge and ad admire your, your take on why lo-fi is relevant in this day and age, because I feel like there's so much technology that's that's forced on us, and I just, just watching your animations and, and, and paper is 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 awesome. So keep keep doing what you're doing. I just want to say thanks. Aw, thank you so much. 
Yeah, I think we really like don't understand how much we need connection. It's not just like connection to people either. Like I really think we, I, I don't know. I, I, I definitely feel like disoriented with a lot of like black box technology, things that are frictionless. I don't know, it's just, yeah. But thank you. <laughs> oh, there's a question back here. All the way Hold on the other hand. side. Okay. <laughs> Should have brought roller skates. <laughs> Hi. Um, I think something that I noticed really complimented just like the like elegance of your work is also like the elegance of the documentation, like down to like the sound in your videos. And I was just wondering like, like what is the documentation process for you and how do you capture the work in a way that really like like gives it the I don't know like platform that it deserves oh thanks I think I don't know I think I realized at some point in time that like if I didn't showcase and make the case as well as I could for my work then no one else would and um it, it I really like I want to work on like projects that feel meaningful to me, um, but I end up in these, it, it's weird, you know, it's like between disciplines. And so um, I feel like I really have to like make the case for it. Like it doesn't automatically just like slot into like a certain category. Um, so yeah, I um, I really love doing stop motion animation. And so like the this book is a planetarium and this book is a camera, like used a little bit of like those stop motion techniques. Um, but yeah, I, it's exhausting um, because whenever I finish a project, I'm like, oh, finally, I figured out how to make it work. It looks good, there's words in it, and there's no typos, you know, there's like all of these different processes. But then it's not really done until I figure out a way to like document it and put it on the internet because like that's, that's where our social lives are in terms of those things. And so um, I think sometimes it really feels like a drag though, because you're like, I really want to be done and go out and celebrate. And it's like, no, actually I have one more project to do because like documentation is like a whole project. But um, I also, like a lot of times I don't really know what a project is about until I finish it and document it. <laughs> um, I think they call this like post, post facto rationalization. I think it's, it, I, I people, tend to have a negative opinion of it, but I think a lot of times, like when you're working intuitively and you're feeling things out and tinkering and working with your hands, you're kind of drawn to different ideas that feel vital and exciting and you don't really know. Um, and so I've found it to be very helpful in terms of understanding like what the next project will be if I like sit down and both like take photographs of it, video of it, and like write about it and just kind of like try to pinpoint like what it is that feels like exciting to me. Um, and that also, sometimes it feels like, oh, it's like a comedian breaking down their own joke and figuring it out. But it really has like helped me figure out what the bridge to the next thing is a lot of times. So. Other questions? I'm so happy you all have questions. Those are great questions. This too. makes me feel useful. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm also a student, and your work is just mesmerizing. It's like absolutely incredible. Aww. Um, <laughs> I think one thing that I've noticed is like you really work like across the board on a lot of different projects, a lot of different things. And has there been like a variety of experiences where you found yourself just like having the knowledge of like designing an app or designing a site or like a poster that's led up to it? Or do you often find that when a project is given to you, you then go out and you spend a little bit of time learning a new software or a new program or something fine tuned to that uh, project, yeah? Yeah, yeah, definitely the latter. And even if it's something I've done before, like I try to like relearn it because I think things are always changing. Like say, I don't know, like, I've designed logos in the past, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I can just like jump straight into 
because like the entire landscape of like what colors mean and what shapes mean has changed since the last time like I thought about that. Um, so like I feel like it's always an adventure, but um, definitely like when I started my my career, like I went to school for I always went to school for studio art because. Um, I felt like I'd have access to more tools that way, you know, because I, I went to school at Pratt, so like some of our final projects were paintings, and then someone like poured a bucket of water down the stairs, you know, it's like no telling, you know, it's like, so I enrolled in studio art so I could like go to the photo studio, use the silkscreen studio, do all of these things, um, and it wasn't like, so I kind of did the same thing like in my graphic design life too, that I, my friends would approach me and they'd say, hey, Kelly, you know, I have this like cable access TV show and I need an animation for it. Can you do that? And I would say, yes, I can do that. Even though I had no clue to do that, how to do that, but I just figured it out. And, um, you know, I, I find that like in the same way that like, you don't really learn a foreign language until you like go to another country and have to figure out how to eat <laughs> and talk to people to eat. Um, I kind of did the same thing, which is a little bit risky to say like, yes, I absolutely can code this HTML website for you, but um, you know, you can figure it out. <laughs> it's like, sure, yeah, you can make a paper turntable. <laughs> but I, I, I think that I like, um, I don't know, I just like really like learning things. Like I, if I'm not answering a question of like, will this work? I'm not as motivated. I like, I don't know, like I wish I could be more motivated by something like money, but I'm kind of motivated by trying to answer questions. <laughs> Maybe time for one more if, if there's another question. One of the things that I've tried to do is to bring craft into some of our decision making. So an example of that would be um, when I'm looking at putting together a board and I'm explaining what the requirements are to be part of a board. And one of them typically, so you'll have like 10 different criteria, one of them always being you need to fundraise for whatever amount of money. Uh -huh. And it's always something that on a piece of paper really makes people uncomfortable. So what I try to do is present it in kind of a crafty way, but that has not always been, um, it's, not al it's, it's not always been comfortable. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's for, the CEOs and the CEOs of, comp of corporations. So I, I think I really appreciate that piece of it. And I think that all of that can have a much more profound impact in, in, corp in corporate structures. So whatever way you can keep that moving forward without it being you know, something negative. Yeah. Positive. Yeah, I feel like no one really understands numbers larger than 50, right? Like, you know, like we're all kind of like, we have these like monkey brains and it's like, okay, I can, I can visually see and experience that there are this many objects here. And so, yeah, trying to understand proportion and like large numbers and what happens when you add another zero, it's just, I mean, that's why I love the Eames powers of 10 because like it shows you scale on, in, in like the, the, the language that everyone can, immediately access and I feel like it's so important I mean even from like kind of like a, a political standpoint like you know like some people have this just innate ability to like hold all of these numbers and abstractions in their brain but most people don't you know like it's kind of like a, a very specialized thing um, and so but now we're all like 
working, you know, and living on the internet, which is at this massive, massive scale. Um, and so I think that there's something really important in figuring out how to navigate those abstractions, make them tangible, make them accessible for people, um, and really like promote things that meet, you know, promote things and promote design that like meet people like halfway and explaining things that are otherwise like not graspable. So um, you're doing God's work. <laughs> All right, let's give one more round of applause. Thanks. Thank you.